requesting that the defendant be held without bail based on the facts of the case, the strength of the Commonwealth's case, and the potential penalty. On Friday, January 27, 2023, using an erasable whiteboard because she was still temporarily intubated, one of the first questions that Lindsay Clancy asked was, do I need an attorney? She knew that she had murdered her children, and she had the clarity, focus, and mental acumen to focus on protecting her own rights and interests. The following is a summary of the events that led to the murders of Cora Clancy, Dawson Clancy, and Callan Clancy. On the morning of Tuesday, January 24th, 2023, the defendant took her five-year-old daughter, Cora, to the pediatricians for an appointment. She interacted with a receptionist, nursing staff, and a doctor. There were apparently no issues with the defendant's de demeanor or behavior as she completed the appointment and was allowed to leave with Cora without any issues or concerns. When she returned home, she went outside with Cora and her three-year-old son, Dawson, to play in the snow. They built a snowman. The defendant sent photos to her mother and to the defendant, uh, straight that to her husband. She texted with them. Nothing in the text was out of the ordinary or any sign of any distress or trouble. Back inside later that day at 4.02 p.m., the defendant searched on her phone, Kids Miralax. She then searched at Takeout 3V via her cell phone at 4.13 p.m. Immediately after doing that, she used Apple Maps on her phone to determine how long it would take someone to drive from her home in Duxbury to 3V restaurant in Plymouth. So she would know how long someone would be gone if they were in that errand. She next went on the CVS website at 4.47 p.m. and then called CVS on Summer Street in Kingston. She spoke to the manager of CVS and asked if they had the kids Miralax. The manager told her no, but they had other similar medications. According to the manager of CVS, her voice did not sound slurred or impaired in any way. She had no trouble understanding the defendant, and it was a perfectly normal converse conversation. At 4.53 p.m., the defendant texted her husband, who was working in his home office, in their basement. She texted, any chance you want to do takeout from 3V? I didn't cook anything. It's been a long day. This was an unusual request as when the family ordered takeout, they usually go somewhere closer to home, but it was a place that they had been in the past. Patrick Clancy texted back yes, and then the defendant asked him to check the menu. At 5.06 p.m., the, def the, the husband texted the defendant um, asking uh, what she was going to get. She responded, a Mediterranean Power Bowl. She spelled it correctly, and it was something that was on the menu. He then told her that he wanted the scallop and pork belly risotto. At 5, 10 p.m., the defendant called 3V Restaurant to place the order. She got the order correct. She gave the correct name for pickup, Patrick. The hostess who took the call said there was nothing out of the ordinary about this call. She was able to understand the defendant that... Um, her voice was not slurred or impaired in any way. At 5.15 p.m., Patrick Clancy headed out the door to run these errands at the defendant's request. As he left, she texted him Pedialax liquid stool softener. Surveillance footage shows Mr. Clancy at CVS on Summer Street in Kingston at 5.32 p.m. He goes to the medication aisle, the children's medication aisle. Phone records show that he called the defendant at 5.33 p.m. and she did not answer the phone. She then calls him back at 5.34 p.m. and the call lasted 14 seconds. He's there at the store unsure of which medication to get and she tells him exactly what she wants. He had no issues communicating with her. It was a completely normal call, although he did mention that she seemed like she was in the middle of something. He is on surveillance footage during this time, exiting that aisle and appeared to be using his phone. He then heads to the register, makes his purchase, and leaves the store at 5.37 p.m. He's next seen on footage at 3V Restaurant at 5.54 p.m. He picks up the, the food and he's out of there within a minute. When he arrives home, the first thing he noticed was the silence. He did not see or hear the defendant or the children. He actually called her cell phone at 6.09 p.m. looking for them, and she did not answer. He went to their bedroom on the second floor, and the door was locked. He was able to open it, and when he looked inside, he saw blood on the floor in front of a full-length mirror in the window open. He immediately runs downstairs and into the backyard, where he finds the defendant laying on the ground. 
She appeared to have cuts on her wrists and neck, but he stated to 911 that those wounds were no longer bleeding. She was conscious. He called 911. During this time, he asked the defendant, what did you do? She responded to him, I tried to kill myself and jumped out the window. During the 911 call, Patrick can be heard asking the defendant, where are the kids? He later told police that she replied, in the basement. So immediately after this happened, she knew what she had done and she knew where the kids were. When EMS arrived, he asked them to stay with her so he could go find his kids. The 911 call kept going. Patrick can be heard on the 911 call entering the home and heading to the basement. At one point, he calls out, guys. He can then be heard screaming in agony and shock as he found his children. His screams seem to get louder and more agonized as the time passes. Cora and Callan were on the floor in the den area of the finished basement, which is to the left when you walk down the stairs, while Dawson was alone on the floor in his father's home office, which is to the right when you go down the stairs. Each child still had the exercise band that was used to strangle them tied around their necks when their father found them. Dawson and Callan were face down on the floor. Cora was on her side with her torso tor tor turned towards the floor. He removed the bands and begged them to breathe. He continued to scream uncontrollably and screamed for officers to come to the basement. The dispatchers are hearing this and they send help down to the basement. And when they encounter Patrick, he yells out, she killed the kids. The police rushed the children to ambulances that brought them to the hospital. And unfortunately, Cora and Dawson were declared dead at the hospital. Callan was med flighted to Boston Children's Hospital. Medical staff was able to restart his pulse, but not his brain activity. He was placed on life support for several days before passing away. The defendant was transported to South Shore Hospital and then to a Boston area hospital where she remains. She sustained several broken bones in her back and her rib cage. The police were able to find several notebooks in the defendant's home pursuant to a search warrant and also notes on her phone that were similar to journal entries. In the months, weeks, and days preceding January 24th, 2023, the defendant meticulously detailed her daily activities, her children's lives, her mental state, and her medication use. Her writing was clear, precise, and articulate. She never indicated that she was hallucinating, delusional, or had disordered thoughts or speech. In all of her writing, she appears to know who she is, where she is, the date, and with whom she's interacted. She wrote a note on her phone the day before killing the children, stating that she had, quote, a touch of postpartum anxiety, end quote, around returning to work. She wrote that her psychiatrist had prescribed medication to help her. The defendant was initially diagnosed, according to her husband, with generalized anxiety disorder. He was then evaluated at the Women and Infant Center for Women's Behavioral Health in Providence, Rhode Island on December 20th, 2022. There, after an evaluation, she was told in the presence of her husband that, by psychiatrist, that she did not have postpartum depression and that she had no symptoms of postpartum depression. She wrote in her journal that at times she had suicidal ideation in December of 2022, and she also told her husband that she had suicidal thoughts and on one occasion had thoughts of harming her children. But she did not write or voice those thoughts after a stay at McLean Hospital. When she had those thoughts, she consulted with a psychiatrist and with her husband, and then she committed herself to McLean Hospital on January 1st, 2023. She was discharged by the hospital on January 5th, 2023. And the hospital did not file any paperwork at that time, attempting to have her committed as a danger to herself or others. She also kept meticulous and detailed daily medication logs in a diary that she wrote. She detailed that she had difficulties with each of the medications that were prescribed to her. And when she had issues with those medications, she detailed how her doctor had her stop that medication or wean off of it and then try something else. They were trying different medications to see what would work for her, what would benefit her. According to her husband, she was never on more than four to five medications at one time. And at the time of the murder, she was taking only three medications. And he said to the police that she always took the medications as prescribed. After her stay at McLean, the defendant appeared to be getting better, according to her husband. 
She slept well, interacted with friends and family. She went out with her kids and husband to places like the Kingsbury Club in Duxbury, the Charlie Horse Restaurant, the Museum of Science in Boston, the Cape Cotter down the Cape, interacting with her family and the public without any apparent difficulties. She even stayed alone with the children on several occasions without any issues in January of 2023. Her husband asked her in mid-January, are you still having suicidal thoughts? And she said, no. The defendant's parents visited the family the weekend of January 21st, 2023. They interacted with the defendant in person. The defendant was able to run errands while her mom watched the children. She texted back and forth with her mother and there was nothing out of the ordinary about these text messages. In fact, the defendant texted her mother on January 22nd, 2023 to ask how her, home, her ride home went. During this conversation, the defendant's mother wrote, quote, enjoyed seeing everyone this weekend. Nice to see you doing better, end quote. On the night of the killings, Patrick Clancy was interviewed by the police at Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth Hospital. He told the police that the defendant was having one of her best days. She was smiling and happy, and there was no indication that she was going to harm the kids. No one, no one at all described her as acting like a zombie in the days leading up to the murder or on the day of the murders themselves. On February 5th, 2023, this past Sunday at 1.35 p.m., while sitting with Dr. Paul Zizel, the psychologist hired by defense counsel to evaluate her mental state, the defendant used Dr. Zizel's cell phone to call her husband. She left a voicemail stating that she loved him. Yesterday, on February 6, 2023, at 10.09 a.m., she again used Dr. Zizel's cell phone to call her husband. This time he answered, and during this call, the defendant stated that after he left the house that night, she killed the kids because she heard a voice and had, quote, a moment of psychosis, end quote. He asked her what voices she heard, and she said she heard a man's voice telling her to kill the kids and kill herself because it was a, her last chance. Patrick Clancy told the police the defendant had never heard voices before. He also told the police the defendant had never used the word psychosis to him before. The first time she used that word psychosis was when she was with the doctor hired by defense counsel and using his cell phone. The defendant actually wrote a note on her phone on October 25th, approximately three months before this happened, October 25th, 2022. She wrote, quote, I think I sort of resent my other children because they prevent me from treating Cal like my first baby. And I know that's not fair to them, I know that. I was feeling so depressed last evening when Cora and Dawson came home from school. I know it runs off on them, so we had a pretty rough evening. I want to feel love and connection with all of my kids. She then wrote that she wants to have more kids eventually. The children were killed by ligature strangulation. Ligature strangulation causes the victim to become unconscious anywhere from 10 seconds up to a minute. The more the victim struggles, the longer it takes. After the victim is unconscious, the ligature must be held in place with force, squeezing the neck for up to an additional four to five minutes to cause death. Therefore, she had to strangle each of them to unconsciousness and then make sure the bands were squeezing their little necks for several minutes. She could have changed her mind at any point during that time and removed those bands from their necks and she did not. The defendant did not take advantage of the situation when her husband left the home that night. She created the situation, and she used Apple Maps to make sure she would have enough time to strangle each child before her husband returned from where she had sent him. The defendant is a danger to herself and others. She planned these murders, gave herself the time and privacy needed to commit the murders, and then she strangled each child in the place where they should have felt the safest, at home with their mom. She did so with deliberate pre premeditation and extreme atrocity and cruelty. And to supplement what the defense counsel has provided, um, I have a statement of the with the court. Oops. Um, the court Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much.